so thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Um, I'm going to wander around. I think I'll be okay uh, in terms of voice because I have a pretty loud voice, but it, it turns out in the back that you can't hear me. Uh, you can do something. The other thing is, I do like to have an interactive conversation, and so although I have a kind of standard invited talk set up here, if someone really wants to object or argue or throw things, that's cool, and I'd be happy to engage with you. Okay. So I'm interested in how to get robots to do things in a complicated environment. Actually, I have to stand over here so I can see what's going on. So I want to talk about, actually, uh, uh, some robots in my life. So the first thing I did when I, I was, was in graduate school is I worked on this robot at SRI called Figgy. And the way it worked was, I didn't know anything about robots, so I had this robot, physical robot, and I would write a program to control the robot and it would run into the wall. And so I would bring the robot back and change the program around and run it again, and it would run into the wall again. And it did this for months. And over the course of those months, I learned how the sonar sensors on the robot interacted with the wall and so on, and I was able to write a pretty good program for the robot. And I swore then that I wasn't going to do that anymore, and that if anybody needed to be in this machine learning loop of trying things and getting hit in the head and, and, and recovering, it was a computer program and not me. Okay, so then that took me to uh, thinking about reinforcement learning. So the idea of reinforcement learning is, well, the robot runs into the wall and learns from its own experience, and then I get to be left out of that loop, which seemed like a good thing. So I had this little robot called Spanky, and I uh, did a demo in my thesis defense even. So actually, not too long after that, I gave an invited talk at UAI. I had to go back to my email and figure out what it was. It was in 1993, and in 1993, I was still not really enthusiastic about reinforcement learning, and so in fact what I did was I gave a, a talk like this, and I tried to recruit people from the UAI community to come and work on reinforcement learning, because I thought that there were lots of interesting theoretical questions that you guys could do better than I could do. So that was kind of fun, and I met Ross Schachter, and he gave me trouble because I didn't talk about independence properly, and so on, um, and so that was good. But at the same time, I was getting frustrated, because it didn't feel like there was a path from the things that reinforcement learning could do to the kinds of things that I wanted to do with a robot. And in fact, I feel very strongly that way even now. So what I'm going to do is talk about what I've been doing since I did reinforcement learning, and maybe interleave here and there where I think reinforcement learning might fit into the picture, but I don't think it's the whole story. So, uh, you know, after, after that, I started to think about Pompey Peas. Again, I was introduced to Pompey Peas by you guys in some sense, so that was good. And worked on one robot, and now I've been, for the last maybe, oh, oh, eight years or so, been working on this robot called M&M. And uh, what I'm mostly going to do is tell you the story of what we've been doing with M&M, and I'll talk a little bit about learning. It's weird. Every time I hit this button, it goes twice. I've never had this happen before, but we'll deal. Okay, so let me just go here. So, so here's the kind of problem that we face, right? So here's this robot. It's got an environment it's interacting with. It can make observations of the environment. It can take actions. And the goal for us, the engineers, is to find some mapping, some policy that takes the history of actions and observations into the next batch. Right? That's our job as engineers. That's it. There's no, no further job. We need an objective, and presumably the goal is that we would like this policy that's in the head of the robot to get as much sort of uh, expected sum reward as possible. But there are lots and lots and lots of different ways for us as engineers to think of constructing this policy that's going to land in the head of the robot. It could be that we send it coded, it could be that machine learning arrives at that policy, it could be some combination. So I want to really explore how is it in this particular case that I've arrived at a policy to put in the head of my robot. Okay, so this is my example slide. Some of you, if you've heard me talk recently, here's this robot. Imagine the robot looks at the kitchen. It's a very complicated kitchen. It's very messy. I don't know if you can see it. The slide's a little washed out. It's not my kitchen. Big mess. But imagine the robot had to go in there and cook dinner or uh, you know, clean it up or something, and the robot might be very surprised about what's going on in there and say, well, I don't know, where is the fork anyway? This dumb is ruining my joke, so I'm really kind of happy about this. Um, okay, so what makes this problem hard? Well, first of all, so, so I would say it's a Pompey piece. So I don't know if it, in the robotics screen everyone says, well, I would use Pompey piece, but it's too hard. Which I think is just like a failed sentence on so many uh, levels, because either the problem you have is a Pompey piece or it's not. It's not like you have a 
have a choice of whether you can use floppy peas or not. Like, your problem is observable or not. It's partially observable or not. My problem is partially observable. Um, so, and it's, what's, what are the same features about it? Well, it happens in continuous space, but it happens in continuous space of very high dimensions, right? So, how many objects are there in the world? What properties of those objects are we going to attend to? So, it's very high dimensional space. In fact, I'd argue that we don't even really know what the right dimensionality is. Uh, the action space is also continuous, right? The robot has continuous joints, and the horizon is very long. Think about how many like primitive linear motions you would have to do in order to cook dinner in that. That's a lot of little, lot of little motions. And there's uncertainty, and the uncertainty is fundamental. So the robotic community, people like to, if you start to talk about uncertainty, some of them, they kind of roll their eyes a little bit and say, well, if you just had better sensors, you wouldn't have to think about that. But that's just wrong, right? Because no matter how good your sensors are, you can't tell like what's in that Tupperware container and how moldy it is. So you have, to, you have to go look. I don't know what's in Christian's head either, right? And probably sensors are not going to reveal that to me, but maybe some, you know, interactions will. So the uncertainty is not a thing that you can dispel by buying better sensors. It's really something fundamental to the problem that you have to take seriously. Um, okay, so how should we approach this problem, right? So I, there's two caricatures in the corner, right? One is I could just write a bunch of code. The other one is I could take a giant wad of recurrent neural network goo. And I, you know, I'm equally optimistic about these two approaches to arriving at a good policy for the robot. So the way I want to think about this problem is that there's probably a set of fundamental underlying mechanisms that we have to build into our system. Convolution is one of them. I think probably inference is. I think probably lifting is. I think there's a, some set of <laughs> fundamental mechanisms. And on top of those mechanisms, then, we can build things. And right now, I'm going to tell you about a system where we've adopted some set of fundamental mechanisms and hand-built stuff on top of that Although our hope and plan is eventually to replace a lot of the things that we're building by hand with learning. But I feel the need to build a system by hand first to understand some of the architectural designs and trade-offs and so on. Okay, so imagine that your problem is to make a GP, then we probably all are sort of a controller. We're probably all pretty familiar with the structure of a controller, right? There's a box that does state estimation, its job is to take the history of observations and actions and map it into some kind of belief, which is typically a probability distribution of the underlying states. And then there's another component whose job it is to take the belief state and decide what actions to take. So that's pretty standard decomposition. And what I'm going to do is spend some time talking about state estimation and then some time talking about actions. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 oh. So sorry. Okay. Um, so let me say that. Right, the, 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 there's a standard literature of optimal solution for Ponty keys, and it's like hopelessly intractable when you have finite sets of states and actions and observations, and nobody can even really think about it very well in big high dimensional continuous spaces. Um, our strategy is good, okay, so we can't do it optimally, so we have to do it approximately, and we've arrived at some sets of trade offs. One thing that we try to do is build the best state estimator we can. If you're going to do recursive state estimation and you mess up, you've messed up like for the rest of your life. Like you've dropped those bits on the floor and you can't find them again. So we try to make the state estimator like as well as we can, and we do action selection somewhat more haphazardly. Because there's a feedback loop closed around it, which means that we can make up for some, some mistakes that we might make. But I'm going to sort of talk about these two pieces. So for state estimation, when I have my robot in the world, it can get point clouds, right? So those are kind of uh, two and a half new images that come from a connect sensor. It gets detections from an object detector that might say, oh, I think that there's this object here at this pose in the world. Um, and it can get some other kinds of inputs as well. Um, so the question is, how should we represent the belief state and how should we update it based on actions and observations? So everybody knows some standard set of filters. We've all talked about the Bayes filter or a Kalman filter and so on. And those ideas are really powerful. And the question is, how can you use those ideas in a situation where uh, you have a very complicated underlying state space and pretty weird and complicated observation spaces? 
And we arrived at an approach to this problem that I think might be interesting and that I would love to you know, get somebody to think about more, which is the observations that we get, um, different modalities of observations seem to match well with different kinds of filters. And so instead of thinking about having one big filter, we're going to maintain a bunch of filters in parallel and integrate them when we need to. And I know that this is not the optimal strategy, but it turns out to work reasonably well for us. So we keep a bunch of different kinds of filters floating around. So first of all, we have a kind of a database of objects, and for each object, we have some uncertain representation of its properties. Um, we have to worry about the fact that, uh, that we have angles and rotation matrices, and so a bunch of the estimation has to happen in tangent space. Um, we, let's see, oh, we should be Gaussian and uniform. So this is another little trick that we, okay. so by default, so normally people model things like object poses using either a particle filter or a Gaussian, right? Those are the only things anybody is willing to do. We kind of think about our estimation, our representation of the uncertainty, let's say in the position of an object, as a mixture of a Gaussian and a uniform. Like, this roughly means, if I have never seen this thing before, I really, I, I hardly know anything about where it is. If I've seen it, then I have a not a bad, pretty unimodal-ish distribution, unless I got it wrong, in which case it's really wrong. So it, things are really, in our experience, hardly ever bimodal. They're like unimodal or like abnormal, right? So maybe I dropped it and I don't know where it goes. So we spend our time pretty much with mixtures of a Gaussian and then implicitly a uniform. That works out. Um, we also have a representation of the space that we have seen and haven't seen. It's important for the robot to know whether it can drive down the hallway like this, right? That's different from detections. So we have some distributions on object poses. We have distributions on free space. And uh, what we do is we arrange it so that the observations that we get, like if we get detections of objects, they're kind of like conjugate to the distributions of where objects are. If we get observations of free space, that's kind of like conjugate to the representation that you use when you make an occupancy grade. And what we do then is we fuse these things really at query time. So here's the first thing that happened to us when we started to do state estimation. I don't know, you, you can see that those two images are images of two objects in the world. One's kind of including the other one. So you might get uh, detections that say, oh, I saw this object here and this object here. You might move around to get two more detections. If you put, throw those things in the common filter, get a distribution on the, you know, joint distribution on the poses of those objects, and you take the map, odds are they will either be intersecting each other or floating off the table or doing other some totally physically not realistic thing. So really, what you need is that joint distribution plus constraints from physics that say, well, no, they can't interpenetrate, or they're sitting on the table. So what we do, though, but it's really hard to do the estimation with those constraints in place. So we do the estimation without the constraints and apply the constraints at inference time to, say, try to find a map representation subject to the constraint that they are not intersecting. Another example is, if you see this way there's some free space, that tells you something about where the table could be. It's hard to fuse those things and keep that going in a recursive filter. So we keep an estimate of the free space and an estimate of the table's pose. But when I try to get a map, sort of a map map, uh, I think about how both of those pieces of information inform where the object is or where the free space is. OK, so help. So things, so, so what I get, I'm hoping to do is I'll tell you some of my troubles and maybe inspire you guys to, to solve some of them for me. So there's, we have trouble with data association, and I, everyone always has trouble with data association, so we, we still have trouble with data association. So <laughs> is this object the same object I saw when I, you know, from some other view? Um, you know, thinking about how to extend these ideas to large spatial areas. Uh, one idea that I like is, is that you might actually have the filters that are more aggressively filtering your estimates of some properties than others. Right, at this moment, you're here in Australia, maybe you don't live here, you probably own car keys, maybe you're not thinking about them until I talk to you about them, right? So maybe the car keys, you think about them when they matter, but not all the time. So how could you, could you imagine 
swapping things in and out of the set of things that you actively filter, and how could that go? Um, there's a question of resolution, right? Do I talk about fruit or grapes or 37 grapes or this particular grape or how many seeds there are in the grape? Uh, can we let our task drive our focus on these things? And the other thing is, when you have a robot that's supposed to operate in the world, let's like, say, deliver it to your house and, and clean your kitchen or whatever, the filter can't collapse. Like, it's just not okay to say, oh, sorry, is your problem with me that observation? Please reset. You can't do that. So, you, so, so all the time, no matter what, you have to be able to, to be falling back in various kinds of ways. So that's like why we have this mixture of the, you know, the Gaussian and the uniform. So it's the Gaussian, you know, so we keep getting observations that don't fit with the Gaussian very well, we depress that mixture component, and pretty soon we say, you know what, I lost that thing. It's okay, it's okay for the robot to say, it's okay, I lost track of that thing, I must have dropped it, because then it knows well enough to go looking for it again. But you can't say, oh my goodness, my head just exploded, that was an impossible observation. So, you gotta keep going. Okay, so now let me talk about action selection. Actually, that's the easier part, I think, and so I have more to say about it. Um, okay, so if you talk to people and say, I have Pony P, then the standard strategy is to say, oh, good, well, let me help you arrive at a policy for your problem. And in fact, I described this architecture as the architecture of the policy. And if you have a standard, nice, beautiful, little, discrete Pony P, you can throw it into a solver and get out a policy. And the policy actually tells you what the state estimator is supposed to be, and it tells you how to make But we were assuming that we can't really do that. And one of the reasons that, and, and, and in general, I think policies are, okay, so I think policies are a bad idea, on average, or at least for the set of problems I'm interested in. I think you need a policy sometimes. I think you need a policy for riding a bicycle, or flying a fighter plane, or not falling over, or juggling. So those are things where the space of events is not really combinatorially complicated. It's kind of smooth. It's kind of one-dimensional. There's a lot of time pressure. You better not screw up. And those are places where you really need to have a policy. On the other hand, traveling to Australia, I didn't have a policy for that. I made a lot of choices yesterday uh, that were solutions to problems that I did not anticipate would appear, and probably so did all So. Uh, it is true that for some kinds of problems, I think having a, a totally worked out policy in advance is the right way to think about it, but for other problems, it's okay for the policy to be implicit, right? Another representation for a policy is a model and a planner. Right? Given a model, given a transition model, an observation model, a planner, you can compute what action to do next. So that's also a representation for a policy, but it's not one that required you to figure out in advance what you were going to do. So what we're going to do is take seriously the idea that, the, right, that the, okay, maybe there's a, you know, unthinkably many belief states that we could possibly have to react to, but the fact is that we're in one right now, and that's the one we have to react to. And we're going to think about, well, what should I do in that case? Um, and we're also going to rely on the fact that if we make kind of not super optimal choices of what action to do, the fact that we have a feedback loop that goes through the state estimator and so on means that if we do something not quite right, we have lots and lots of chances to come back around and, and, and kind of correct that. So the choices are not like typically not do or die. So then this is this is the architectural setup. Right? So what we're going to do is construct a plan based on an approximate model. And typically, in fact, we're going to be very aggressive in, in determinizing that model, and I'll talk about how that goes. Um, and take the first step and execute it. So the thing to really realize when you think about this is, from the perspective now of the planner, of the decision-making problem, the plant, from a control theory perspective, is everything else, including the state estimate. So I've got a plan. I'm going to think of my planner as basically being a, a, a model predictive control problem in belief space. From the perspective of that planner, the state space is belief now, probability distributions over underlying states in the world. My objective is going to be in belief space. 
And my transition dynamics are going to be in this space. I'm going to think about how is it that when I take an action, it will change my belief about the state of the world. So everything moves. So I'm going to do some examples of this in robotics applications, building up to my own. Just because, actually, maybe this crowd, if I don't have to go so carefully, but certainly when I try to tell this idea to the robotics people, it causes head explosions. Um, so here's a simple example. Imagine that we had a little point robot. This is a ridiculous simple example. Point robot in the plane. That's the kind of robot. Point robot in the plane. And you know, when it's in the darker part of this world, it can't. It has bad sensing of where it is. But when it's in the brighter part, it has good sensing. And so its belief is going to be some distribution over where it is. And uh, its goal is going to be to arrive at some location with low variance. Right? Goals have to be in belief space. You never know what the real state of the world is. That's not appropriate. The objective of the objective is the belief space. The belief is to the objective is to arrive somewhere. With Low uncertainty. So what should this robot do? What should this robot do? Question. Go that, go that way. Right. So maybe he should like, go over to where it's bright. Even if he's trying to reach an objective over on the other side of the dark, he should go over where it's bright and then maybe go back. Okay. So oh so initially go right. So I was doing this work with a postdoc and with Russ Tegrick, who works in really in controlling walking robots. And his observation was that planning and belief space is an underactuated control problem. So a control problem is underactuated informally if you don't have a motor for every degree of freedom. Right? So your car is underactuated in a sense because it doesn't have a motor that will drive it sideways. If you want to go sideways, you can do that, but it takes work and maneuvering and some free space and that sort of thing. So if you have an underactuated robot, but it's okay if you have an underactuated robot, you can still plan for it. It's a little more complicated, right? So you have some state space, which describes the uh, maybe the positions and velocities of the joints, and some objective you want to reach, and some dynamics, and you find it. So robotics people understand how to do that very well. So now let's think about planning in belief space. So in belief space, maybe I'm going to represent that in that little example. I have a mean and a covariance that represents uh, the belief about uh, where that robot is in the world. Um, and I might have an objective, like I want the mode of my belief to be here, and I want a, a zero variance, that I should have been small variance, right? So I have small variance in, a, in the mode. And then the question is, what are the dynamics? Actually, let me just go back. Oh. Um, and the reason that this is an underactuated control problem is that maybe in this example I can move my mean around, right? So I can apply, uh, you know, forces to my little robot or something to move the mean of my belief. That's not so hard. But I don't have a motor for the variance, right? Like, wouldn't it be nice if I had the variance reduction motor? Now, if I had a, a GPS that could just work really, you know, I could, I could say, oh, I'm going to sense now. That would be a variance reduction motor if I could apply it everywhere. But in this case, I can't, right? So it's just analogous to not being able to move sideways in the car. I also can't move just to lower my variance. So I have to take actions in the world that will put me in a position so that I can lower my variance. So it's the same sort of story. And the maneuver that we make, so we can say, well, OK, what are the dynamics? So uh, in order to plan, we need dynamics. What are the dynamics of the belief state? Well, everybody understands some variation on a common filter, right? So some variation on a common filter. You have your old mean invariance, you have an observation, and action gives you a new mean invariance, so that's good. So that's cool. So that seems like it could be our dynamics. Except there's in, if you're planning, you need your dynamics needs to take a state and an action to a new state. What we have here is something that takes a state and an action and an observation to a new state. But we don't know what the observations are going to be. And so normally when you do planning under a certain you have to branch on the observation. But we're not willing to tolerate that because our problems are too hard. So what do we do? What we do is that we actually substitute in for the observation where we would normally branch. We just put in the most likely observation, the mean or the mode or some convenient thing like that. And so that gives us now a dynamics that has got the shape that we want. It takes a state and an action to a new state under the assumption that we're going to get the observation that we expect to get. Okay, so 
This is kind of a weird thing to do. It, it sounds pretty stupid, actually, but it works sort of well. So let me see if I can explain why. So one thing is, let's see, people who live who are a certain age uh, remember an old thing from the Soviet Union. Uh, so we should trust but verify. Right? So if somebody tells you something, you should trust them, but you should verify. So I think of this is the trust but verify planning. So we're going to make a plan under the assumption that we're going to see the thing we expect to see. But we're forcing the variance to be low in the goal, which means we're going to force ourselves to go look. So we're going to verify. We're going to go look. We're, going to, we're planning under the expectation we're going to see the thing we're expecting to see. But if we don't, we'll replan. So uh, let me just kind of illustrate this story here. Uh, so uh, imagine that we make a plan using those values. So that big yellow circle is our initial uncertainty. Our objective is to be over there with a small uncertainty. And if I call a kind of traditional trajectory optimiz optimizer using those dynamics I told you about, I'll get a plan that looks like this. In this particular domain, there's no transition error, right? So it goes, it goes over to the white, it hangs out there for a while, it gets nicely localized, and then it runs off. Does that picture make sense to everybody? Oh, question. Yes, good. Um, so, so, so thinking about your, your heuristic there, uh, if, if you were, if I was thinking about how I want to solve that problem correctly, right, in Bayesian, I want to take the expected value over the possible observations and optimize that. And so what you, you seem to be doing is taking the expected observation and plugging that in instead. Right. And that's, it seems to me that that system works only if the system is linear. So if it's linear, then, then plugging the expectation is, is great, but if you have a nonlinear system, right. then it might not work so well. Right. So, the, right. And the only place where, the, so the question is, what does it works mean? So we can prove a theorem about it. If the system's linear, then this is an optimal strategy. Our systems aren't linear, and this is not an optimal strategy, but it's what I do anyway. But if it's close to linear, where for some you are, then maybe the approximation is not bad. Right. But I'm just coming at these things from this other direction, which is that I have to do something today on my robot, and this is what I'm doing. And what I'm hoping is to try to close the theoretical gap between, yeah, it all totally works if everything's linear and Gaussian, too. It actually works OK for me and my problems. And why is that? So yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, okay, so here's the initial trajectory that, that it says, I think this is how it's going to play out. Now, the thing is, it, it probably won't play out like that. So what we do is we say, well, okay, I'm going to start executing the controls on that trajectory. But I'm going to keep track, and if I deviate from the trajectory a certain amount, I'm going to replan. So now here's an illustration of, of what actually happens in a particular run. So here's a case where the robot thought, you know, its mean was in the center of the big yellow circle, and the yellow circle was its uncertainty. But in fact, we were really terrible to this robot, and it, it started at that plus sign. So it was pretty far away. So it made that initial trajectory, it started to execute it, but as it executed it, it got observations, and its observations told it that it was actually not where it thought it was. It was somewhat farther down. So it made a new plan, executed a piece of it, got some more observations, fell off the trajectory, made a new plan, and so on. And what it ended up doing was actually executing that blue trajectory. Uh, so Rob, the postdoc who we were working with, was able to prove that under some detailed assumptions, but not terrible ones, that in this particular problem, so this is a very simple problem, that in fact you would converge to the goal with a finite number of the planning facts. Okay, so that's, a, that's one simple example. I'm going to do another simple example and then make it a little more complicated. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is deal with the fact that we don't, we're not a point robot in the plan. You know, my robot's got like, I don't know, 20 degrees freedom. It lives in three space. So what do we do about that? Well, we have to, so we have to, somehow connect up to geometric planning. So one piece of robotics kind of technical work that's pretty mature, works reasonably well, is planning in geometrically specified domains. So how do we take our uncertain planning problem and turn it into a geometric planning problem, if we can? So what I want to do now is introduce the idea of a shadow world. So imagine that we have, again, like we've got some kind of big common filter, and we have estimates on the poses of the objects in the world. 
to the Gaussian estimates of poses the world, what we want to do is think about how to plan in a, in a how to do some sort of belief space planning in a domain like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to commit to the mode. So we're going to assume that, in fact, those mode distributions describe the uncertainty pretty well. Um, and so we have a single Gaussian on the poses of the objects. And then for each object, what we're going to do is make what we call an epsilon shadow, which is a region of space that, with probability 1 minus epsilon, contains the whole object. Right? And so the intuition is, well, it's, so it's like a confidence interval on the, on the thing. So here's an example. Imagine up in, in the plane, here's the robot, there's a little table, and imagine that there's some Gaussian describing this uncertainty on the pose of the table. So we can do a kind of a sigma point thing, right? So we can take the, the, the sigma points of that distribution, place the table down at each of those sigma points, do some convex hull shenanigans, not the whole convex hull, but the convex hull and the convex pieces and then the unions of those, and get a region of space that with high probability uh, contains the object, like a confidence interval on that table. Now that gives us a geometric object, and that's good because we can now turn our problem of planning under uncertainty of where the objects are in space to a geometric problem. So let me just kind of illustrate that in cartoons. So imagine that there's two objects in the world, uh, and I've drawn the mean objects and the shadows. The robot starts here and wants to go there. Imagine that. So these are actually shadows uh, of, I'm putting all the uncertainty in the objects. Typically, you can think about there's uncertainty in the robot, uncertainty in the objects, but I think about the relative pose, and I just make the shadows uh, on the relative pose distribution of the object with respect to the robot. So then the planning process goes like this, right? The robot might contemplate moving forward if it moves somewhere. So it turns out that in my robot, in many robots, the odometry is really bad, right? So it, you, it, 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 it thinks it's going a certain distance, and it really has it. It's got these caster wheels. They don't measure counter revolutions very well. So the robot moves and it becomes pretty uncertain about where it is with respect to the objects. Shadows grow. But the robot can look at an object, and it's going to, in its head, right, the planning model is, I'm going to look at that object, and its uncertainty is going to shrink around the mean. Right, so that's the same assumption, that I'm assuming that I'm going to get an observation that just keeps the mean where it lies. I'm not going to make a plan that branches on the different observations I might get. I'm just going to assume I get an observation at the mean, so the uncertainty will shrink. Uh, then I can move forward over here, and then the shadows get bigger again, and I look at the green table, and I can move closer. So this is another example of that same notion of belief space replanning under the assumption that we're going to get the median observation. And again, what happens is in real life, the robot moves, it looks, it sees the table in a different place, and it makes a new plan. It's okay. Right? It forces itself to look, which is what gives us the robustness. <laughs> So you will see later on, I'll show you some pictures that look like this. Uh, so this is the robot now, the model of the robot doing some things in the world, and it looks all blurry, and it's not because we're bad at graphics, but because I'm trying to actually illustrate the shadows, the uncertainty on the objects and so on. Okay, so now one more piece of stuff. One more elementary example, and then we'll like look at the real robot. So the other thing is that the, the robot in the kitchen or a robot in this room or something. There are lots of objects. And I think one thing that UAI knows is that Christian has lots of you know, uh, that, that really factoring and lifting are our key tools for dealing with environments that are really complicated in terms of high dimensionality, large numbers of objects, and so on. So now the question is, can we, what, what would be a good representation of belief states and belief space so that we can plan in domains where we have lots of objects. So, um, so let me now talk about using logical fluence to describe sets of belief states. And I'm going to have a running example of a, a simple fluent, a simple sort of proposition about the world that's going to be the location of an object. And in this case, it's just it's a discrete thing. It could take one of three values. Right, so a belief, the belief space for something you can take one of three values is this little simplex and one point in simplex. And so we're going to use a kind of 
homemade epistemic logic uh, that looks like this. Uh, so we're going to use the, this, this fluent B for beliefs. So it's, it's a fluent, and it takes as its first argument another fluent, like uh, some, something that, let's think of it as a random variable. So think of phi as a random variable. Uh, so I believe that phi has value v with probability, oh man, that's hard to speak, v, v, and p. I believe phi has value v with probability at least p. That's what b, phi, v, p. <laughs> oh man, I have never said that value before, that's really odd. Okay. That corresponds to something like, so that is a description of a set of distributions. Right? It's a set of belief states. And you can think of that little pyramid there with the I at the top of the pyramid, and that is the value of V, the corner of the simplex uh, that goes with value V. Then the set of belief states where I believe with high probability that V has value V corresponds to the little blue upper corner of that thing. Similarly, sometimes I actually want to be able to reason about V not having a particular value, but just that I know the value of V pretty well. Right, so I use this too, BB. I believe the value of phi is probably phi. This is useful for reasoning about the future. Right? Like I can, the classic example from old epistemic logic is if I ask Christian for his phone number, he will tell me and I will know it. Right? I can reason about that happening in the future, but I have to be able to talk about knowing the phone number without knowing a particular value. Right? So that's that's that. So there's some value such that I know it's the value. And that corresponds to this interesting set of distributions, right? It's the corners of the simplex. I can't tell you which corner I'll be in, but I'll be in one. So that's kind of a useful idea. Okay. So now let me talk about a planning strategy and then about how we can describe the dynamics of planning in a domain using those belief fluids. So for reasons that I'll get to in just a minute, right? Um, we, we do backward chaining planning. And so backward chaining planning says, I'm going to start with a goal. A goal is a set of belief states, right? So we said our goals are going to be sets of beliefs, right? I want the variance to be less than this, so I want the mean to be near that. So our goals are sets of beliefs. And we'll chain backwards. We'll think about what could the last action be that I would take. And the pre-image of the goal under that action is the set of beliefs such that if I were in that belief and were to take that action and get the mean observation, I would end up in the goal. And so this is my planning process, this is backward chaining. And in fact, we mix in backward chaining inference steps with backward chaining planning steps that are not really different. So we can search backwards until we arrive at some goal, some sub-goal, that is to say a set of belief states, that contains the current belief state. And when that's true, we know that we have a plan that would work, right? So in this case, we could do A2 and then A1, and we would reach the goal. So that's going to be the plan strategy. So now, let me show you how that plays out in a very small example. So imagine here's the robot, there's three states, there's an object in the world, and it's in one of three locations, and that's it. OK. So, um, the robot can look in one of the locations and either see something or not, or it can try to move the object from somewhere to somewhere else. And there's noise in its observations and noise in its actions. The details don't matter too much. Its goal is to believe with high probability that the object is in location zero. Okay, so the next maneuver is to write down planning rules that look sort of like strips operators or pivotal operators or something. But they're articulated in terms of belief fluids. Right? Because again, we're not describing the dynamics of the underlying state of the world, we're describing the dynamics of the belief process. So we might say, for instance, if your goal, if your result is to believe that the location of O is some target with probability P, you could come to believe that by moving the object. Uh, but the precondition would have to be that you believe in it, that it's in the, in the previous location with high probability. And we can compute an appropriate probability so that it, it attenuates in the right way given the uncertainty in our ability to move things. So that's a, that's a planning rule. Here's a more interesting planning rule. Another way to come to believe that an object is in a location is to look there. Now, under the assumption that you're going to get the mean observation, the observation that you want, 
you still, there's a precondition. The precondition is that, you know, you might say, if I want to believe that this object is here at 0.9, and I have certain uncertainty in my ability to observe and so on. So uh, if I just run Bayes' rule backwards, I can say, well, oh, cool. If I believed there was zero probability point six, and I looked and I saw it, then afterwards I would believe it's zero probability point nine. So I can do backward chaining like that. So this is pretty cool because I can write these rules, and they're pretty general purpose, and they apply to all kinds of objects and all kinds of situations, and I can use them in a pretty general purpose plan. So let me illustrate this now. Um, uh, just, just to get the idea. So imagine that again, our goal is with high probability we think the object is in location zero, and imagine that the top point of this simplex is location zero. So the little red triangle is our goal. We want to believe with high probability that the object is in is there. So we start out with some initial belief, which is that blue dot, and we run the planner, and the planner says, well, okay, you know what? If you look there twice, and you see it both times, you'll believe it's up there in the upper corner, right? So the pre-image of the red triangle is the orange one, under looking and getting the observation you hoped for. And the pre-image of the orange tri triangle is the yellow one. Does that make sense? So this is, if you start anywhere in the orange triangle, look, see the thing, you'll end up in red, in, oh, so anywhere in yellow, look, you'll end up with orange, anywhere in orange, look, see the thing, you'll end up in red. So that's our optimistic robot strategy. So it's going to look in location zero. It looks in location zero and doesn't see the thing. It doesn't normally base belief update and its belief ends up over here. It's very sad. It has to reinvoke the planner. The planner says, okay, that's all right, we can do this. And it ends up with the following plan. The, the, the plan is to look at location, now it thinks location two is the most likely place. It says, I'm going to look at location two. That will take me from the green region to the yellow one, and I'll be pretty sure that the object is in location two. Then I'll move the object to location zero, which will take me into the orange region, and then I'll look there to verify, and that will take me into the red triangle. So that's its best plan. Right? It executes a step without it, doesn't see the thing there either. It makes a similar plan with respect to location one, which is where the thing really is, uh, makes an observation, uh, and that takes it up to the one. So that's the idea. Of re planning in a blue space one more time. Okay, we can do the similar sort of thing with continuous random variables. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, when we have an actual robot and we have to think about planning for the actual robot, you can't make all the instances of all your operators because they have lots of continuous parameters, and there's a whole complicated, subtle question about how you sample values of parameters like grasps and poses and configurations for the robot. But I'm not going to go into that here. One more high level point is how we deal with the long horizon. So, uh, you know, we talked about the robot trying to clean the kitchen. You might imagine hundreds of thousands of human actions. So nobody could even think about making a plan 100,000 steps long. Furthermore, under uncertainty, there's no point, right? Like, so yesterday I flew to the Sydney airport. I've never been to the Sydney airport. I had no idea what it shaped like, what gate I would land in, who would be standing in front of me when I tried to walk down the hallway. It would have been ridiculous to try to make a primitive level plan to deal with that. I just did it when I got there, right? And so did you. So this is our strategy. Also, we start with a high level goal. We make a plan at some level of abstraction. And unlike most AI hierarchical planning, which uses the hierarchy as a heuristic to arrive at a complete plan, we don't do that. We make a hierarchical plan, like I'm going to go to Sydney, and then we just believe that it's going to work, that I can walk through the airport when I get there. And so then I just take the first part, and I worry about how to get into my level of plan. That's it. So I take that first sub goal and plan for it in more detail. And I take, oh, this is really, really impressive. Okay. And I take that first sub goal and plan for it. Until I get to a primitive action in the night. So the fact that we do pre-image back chaining gives us this, gives us the sub goal. So it lets us know what the, what that pre-image was that we're trying to get into. And it also gives us a very convenient execution monitoring strategy. So if I do that first primitive action, P1, and I do a belief update. Now what I'm going to do is ask the question, am I in the image that I thought I would be in, that next one? 
If I am, that's cool, and I'll keep executing my little little plan. If not, I'll pop that plan off the stack and see if there's some part of the next plan that I'm in the premium job. And if so, I'll start from there. And if not, I'll pop that plan. Right? So if my plane gets canceled, I pop the stack somewhere else until I can get myself indexed back in. I don't reconsider my professional career. <laughs> that would be starting from the top every time. Uh, maybe you know people who do that, but it's not a very effective strategy. So maybe it's not. Okay, so now let me find the time for robot. So here's a robot. Um, I'm just going to illustrate now. So we take all those ideas that I told you about and build a system for controlling this kind of robot. In, in this case, its goal is to put the blue box on the left region of the table. Um, and there is a nefarious soup can in the way which it doesn't know about. Um, so the first thing it does is it, it makes a high level plan. So I, there, I don't expect you to actually read these things, uh, but I'll tell you about them a little bit. So this is that hierarchical tree, like the one I showed you. Um, so it's made a hierarchy of plans. Its goal is to believe that that blue box is in the target location. And so what it says is, well, my highest level plan is going to be to place it there and then look to be sure that it's where I thought it was going to be because my placing is not very accurate. So if I were to just place it as my last action, that would be good enough. I'm going to place it in look. And so it makes a plan that says, well, all right, in order to do that, I, in order to do even the rest of the planning, I have to have a better idea of what's going on. So it reasons about where it can stand so it can look at the object. It decides to go there and take a look. And when it does that, it sees the object it was expecting to see, but it also sees an initial object, which sort of surprises it. So it has to kind of pop its plan stack and make a new plan. And so now it says, in order to pick up the object that I want, I have to move through this volume. And in order to move through that volume, it has to be unobstructed. But oh no, that, uh, that volume is not unobstructed because I saw an extra thing in the way. So then it's going to have to reason about how to make that volume unobstructed, and it knows that to unobstruct the volume, it has to take something out of it and so on. So it's going to reason that it has to actually move the red can out of the way. It comes up to the table, wants to look at the red thing because it was uncertain about where it was, realized that its hand was in the way, and moved its hand out of it. Now, this is an inefficiency due to the hierarchy. If somehow we could make the whole plan flat, it would have known that it should have its hand out of its face when it moved up to the table. But uh, one price you pay for doing things hierarchically, generally speaking, is that you lose some amount of optimality. And we're okay with that. In fact, the robot does things like, I don't know if you ever do that, but it will sometimes pick up an object, go over here to put it somewhere, realize that the place it was trying to put it has got something in the way, you'll have to put this object down, move the thing out of the way, pick this up, and then go back to what it was doing. But that doesn't perturb us too much. Okay, so robot is able to do this thing. So I'm actually just going to fast forward to this. We have about 10 minutes, so um, let me. So robot was able to actually execute this stuff with substantial uncertainty and reasonably generous. So what I want to do now is actually. Sorry, this is the thing that I just. So it finally achieves its goal, right? So it moves the red thing out of the way, picks up the blue box, puts it over on the end of the table. Cool. Good. Yeah. So the thing is that basically that same code does a bunch of other things. So here's a case where the robot is supposed to move the green box to the edge of the corner. The green box is too big for it to pick it up, but it can push it. But now the orange thing is in the way. So it picks the orange thing up. And it pushes the green box. Uh, and then it checks this. the pushing is really unreliable. So it checks to see and realizes it's been pushed far enough. And it checks to see again and realizes it's been pushed far enough. So we actually love it when it does this because it messes up all the time, but it's pretty robust at being able to fix up its mistakes. So, one more example of what this basically, again, basically the same code can do. In this case, we asked the robot to go out of the lab. It said, okay, I can get out of the lab. To do that, I have to move through this volume. To move through that volume, the volume has to be free. I look at that volume to be sure it's free. I find there are chairs in the way. It knows about those particular kinds of chairs. It puts them in its model. And now, as before, it has to reason 
that these, you know, these things are uh, in the way, and what are they going to do about them, and it will eventually pick them up and move them out of them. Okay. So, action selection. So, so here's my laundry list of requests from you guys about action selection. So, I think, I mean, so as uh, my interlocutor pointed out, this crazy assumption we're making that we're always getting into observation we're hoping for is not at all justified, and it's, it's not hard to construct cases where it's a terrible, terrible, terrible assumption. On the other hand, it does let us mm, go forward doing our business here, and I don't know another way to do it right now. So, the question is, well, when do you want to assume? When does it work? When does it not work? How can you make it work better? So I think that's kind of interesting to write this question there. Um, let's see, what else? So, so right now, we kind of have two separate inference. There's like inference in the state estimation that does what it does. There's inference in the planner that does what it does. They should probably be more closely connected, but I'm not sure how to do that. Um, there's interesting questions of meta reasoning. Uh, what objects should we be thinking about, right? And that also influences the estimator. And uh, another thing that I think is very interesting is that there's old work in AI and philosophy that has been really forgotten for a long time is in reconsideration. So I have that tasty stack of plans that represent, in some sense, the robot's current intentions. And we're doing a good job of dealing with a case where something goes wrong. When something goes wrong, it's clear that you should pop the stack up until you're back in the regime where things are looking pretty good. What we do not such a good job of is taking advantage of opportunity. So if, if you know if you're walking along at a hundred dollar bill on a pavement, you might stop and pick it up. You might not. I don't know. It depends on your own personal utilities and all that. But you might. Um, but how do you manage the computation unless you decide whether to think about whether it's worth the trouble to pick up the hundred dollar bill? So we have a really nice kind of data structure sitting there waiting for people to think about that. But again, it's clear that you shouldn't reconsider all your life choices based on every new person. So how do you, how could you manage that competition? Okay, I'm going to spend a few minutes and talk about learning. I have a few minutes, so that should work. So how do we add learning to the system? Because my goal in building this system was to understand something about the architecture, about how we might make a thing that does what I want it to do, and then try to take myself to some degree out of the implementation. So, you know, here's a kind of an architectural picture of the system, and we can think about where learning fits in. So, uh, I think there's two important different kinds of learning. Most of the time we think about learning is learning about the world, learning something about the environment outside the robot. Most of the work right now in learning for robots is in these two boxes, right? So, all the deep network stuff is awesome and it helps with perception, although it does not solve it because we don't just need a bounding box and an image, we need an actual, like, read post estimate so that we can try to pick something up, let's say. Also, there's a lot of work in learning primitive policy. So I started out by saying I didn't think reinforcement learning was a whole story. And I definitely don't, but I do think it's a story there, right? So if I want to learn good ways of picking things up or manipulating a pencil or riding a bicycle or walking and so on, so that's awesome. But that's not the whole story. And so then the question is, well, where else does learning go? You can also learn things like observation models and transition models, right? So now that's something more, right? So you can say, now I have to learn, imagine that I learned a new primitive, like I learned to ride a bicycle, but I need to know how to start, or I need to know when I can apply it, or what's the pre-image, what, what has to be true so that if I were to ride my bicycle, a, a certain result would happen, and not a different one, right? So even if someone learns a primitive policy, we have to learn models of those primitives so that we can integrate them with other things. Um, um, so the other kind of learning is what sometimes people call analytic learning. This is a whole conversation that we used to have. So I can also learn how to speed up my own computation. When you learn to play chess, you're doing analytical learning, right? Learning to play chess doesn't involve learning about the external world. You, once you know the rules, you know everything there is to know, and it's a mere computation problem to know what to do. But yet we speak of learning chess, and that is learning to do computation better or more effectively. And there are millions of opportunities for that in the robot, right? We can learn attention strategies or better samplers for the estimation. Uh, we can learn uh, better action samplers for planning, search heuristics, better ways of doing the hierarchical decomposition, estimates of, of high-level abstract actions, costs, and feasibilities, and so on. 
So there are lots and lots of, I think, really interesting learning opportunities in the learning to be more effective in your computation realm, as well as in the learning how the world works. Um, one of the things that I like to think about, so Parker used to talk about the mark of an intelligent being was that we could let our hypotheses die in our stead, right? So instead of actually jumping off the cliff, we could imagine what it would be like to jump off the cliff. And so one thing that's really nice is that if you're going to do reinforcement learning and learn a policy which you're going to execute, then your, the policy is going to jump you off the cliff now and then, right? Or it's going to do whatever it's going to do. But uh, if you learn search control, if you think of your policy not as a thing I'm going to do, but a nice compound strategy that I can contemplate the results, the effects of in this environment, then you don't have to get it right. And I'm really a fan. I like learning a lot, but I like learning better when it doesn't have to be right. So if you can use learning to speed your thinking, but still use models to test the hypotheses, then I think you're in a kind of a sweet spot. And we've been doing other work too now on the kind of learning to speed up certain kinds of planners. Okay, I'm just at this point going to say that after this, there's a million more things, uh, and we could do all of AI, and it'll be really fun, and you guys should help me do that. Um, and then the robot can like tell us. Okay, so I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to So. Thank you.